Hello, everyone, and welcome to the debut Talos live stream. This is the first in a series of events that we're going to be doing, uh, talking about some pertinent defense and threat landscape issues. Today, we're talking about sowing discord and the threat landscape specific to IM and collaboration platforms. Uh, before we get started and welcome our presenter, Chris Neal, to the stage, let's cover a few quick items uh, that will be helpful to you during the broadcast. So this event is being simulcast on LinkedIn and YouTube, and we're going to be doing a live Q&A at the end. So to ask a question, simply post your questions to the event chat on YouTube or LinkedIn, and our intrepid social editor, John, will be collecting those and giving those back to the presenters. Uh, and in addition to Chris, for the Q&A at the end, we'll be joined by Nick Biasini, the US lead for the Talos Outreach Group, and we'll get all those questions answered just as quickly as we can toward the end of the show. One other item is that your feedback, this being a new series, is greatly appreciated. So if there's topics that will be useful to you or useful to our audience that are in your head, please leave those in the chat as well, or just drop us a line on Twitter. You can follow us at Talos Security and leave a comment there. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know what you would like to see in the future. And we'll go from there. So without much further ado, I want to welcome to the stage Chris Neal, our presenter for today, and get this thing started. So Chris, welcome, and let's get going now. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Neal. I am a threat researcher at Talos. I've uh, been here about two years. And before that, I worked at a uh, company out here in California called West America Bank. And uh, I was a SOC analyst there. Um, and skills-wise, I consider myself a generalist. Uh, I have experience in uh, pen testing, incident response, malware analysis, and uh, just basic reverse engineering. Um, and I have a focus on obscure Windows malware. And I'll actually be doing a talk at uh, B-Sides Las Vegas this year on how to analyze auto IT malware. Um, should be pretty fun. Um, and uh, my Twitter handle is uh, at Gojirasan. Uh, I'll be, you know, posting the dates for uh, for that talk uh, on my Twitter if uh, if you're interested. So the title of this presentation is uh, Sewing Discord, and uh, what we're going to talk about today is how Discord and Slack are being abused by a pretty wide range of threat actors. And uh, they're abusing these services at different stages in these campaigns. And uh, we're not going to be talking about specific malware campaigns or specific family or anything like that. But we're going to be going uh, a bit more in depth into the techniques that are actually being used in these campaigns rather than the campaigns themselves. Uh, so this is a continuation of a blog post I worked on with uh, Edmund Brummagen, Nick Biasini, and uh, Paul Eubanks. And so by the end of this... Uh, I hope you guys will have a pretty good understanding of how these services are being abused and you know how you can do more research uh, into this kind of stuff. So, so before we go any further, uh, I wanted to just cover a couple differences and similarities between Discord and Slack. Uh, the main similarity that they have is that they both are um, instant messaging applications. They both do audio and video calls. And um, functionally, they're very similar. Uh, the main difference is that they're kind of geared towards different demographics. Uh, Discord, um, as most of us know, is geared towards uh, gaming communities and tech communities. I know a lot of people in um, InfoSec have moved over to Discord rather than IRC and that kind of stuff. Uh, Slack is uh, more geared towards a professional demographic. Um, a lot of uh, developers use Slack. Uh, it's used in a lot of work environments and different organizations um, who need to have instant messaging uh, capabilities or video calls, things like that. Um, they both have APIs for integrating with third-party apps. Um, the big difference here is that Discord doesn't have a whole lot of out-of-the-box integrations, whereas Slack has a ton of third-party integrations, uh, things like um, Google Drive, um, and I believe Office 365, though I'm not sure. I haven't used Slack professionally uh, too much. But um, when it comes to a user base, uh, Discord has around, according to Discord, they have around 140 million monthly users. 
And uh, that number is from early 2020. So I'm guessing it's only gone up from there because of the um, of the, the pandemic and all that. And uh, as opposed to Slack, who uh, the only number I could find from them was that they had 10 million daily users. That was also from early 2020. Um, so I'm going to say that that's a bit higher now that a lot of people are working from home. And um, it's probably having a lot higher usage uh, nowadays from the pandemic and all that. So basic math, uh, 10 million daily users times 30, that's 300 million uh, monthly users. So that's uh, quite a large um, user base for Slack. So when it comes to malware that is abusing these services, uh, we've seen pretty much every type of malware uh, there is. Uh, we've seen rats, ransomwares, stealers, you name it, it's probably um, it's probably abused one of these services at some point. Um, and what's interesting about this is that it shows that the benefits of abuse of these services are attractive enough to warrant a uh, a large volume of malware samples that um, are reaching out to the different domains uh, for these services. And um, so this is a non-exhaustive list of um, different malware families we ran into while doing this research. Um, these are just the, some of the more interesting ones that uh, we ran across. And there's actually a ton of research that can still be done um, in this in this space. Uh, there were so many files that we ran across, there was no way that we could, uh, we, we could look at all of them. So there's a lot of uh, stuff to still look at. So um, if this seems interesting to you by the end of this presentation, there's um, a lot of cool stuff still out there. So definitely go look for it. Just to give everybody an idea of the volume of samples we ran across while we were doing this research, um, this is a screenshot from um, the Virus Total Hunting platform. And what we were doing here is we were searching for samples that were reaching out to the Discord uh, content delivery network. And it returned over 17,000 samples. And the majority of these were malicious. Um, some weren't, but the majority of them were um, and this is actually a really good way to discover new campaigns that are abusing um, abusing Discord. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more depth later on in the presentation on how the malware abuses the CDN. But uh, I just wanted to show everyone this so you can get an idea of the uh, the amount of malware that's that's doing this. And uh, what we discovered was that the malware campaigns that were abusing these services were actually leveraging that abuse at uh, different attack phases. And um, some campaigns were only doing it in one attack phase, some were doing it in two, some were doing it in all three. And I'll be go going over each uh, attack phase and what kind of abuse is happening at each phase uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. So I think an important question to ask with regards to this abuse is, uh, why is it happening? Uh, so first off, um, one of the most important things for a malware operator to do while they're running a campaign is stay anonymous because if you can't stay anonymous then you're not going to have a malware campaign for very long uh, someone's going to track you down and then that's the end of that so um, second reason is the ease of use um, the abuse that we cover in this uh, talk is not very complicated uh, a lot of these um, techniques that are being used have open source tools either on GitHub or they're out there floating around um, and they're all very easy to use and um, don't take a lot of skill to implement. So um, another big reason is that there's no need to maintain an infrastructure for your malware campaign. So you're essentially using servers that aren't yours that you don't have to take care of. Um, basically all you need is a login and all you got to figure out is how to get people to either download the malware or click a link or whatever the attack um, vector is. And last but not least is it's free. Um, all this abuse that we'll be covering can be done with a free account. You don't need a premium account. Um, and so all of these factors combined make it very attractive to uh, malware operators that are looking for a cost-effective way of um, running a malware campaign. And um, so up next, we're going to talk about you know, who is doing this. So interestingly, there doesn't seem to be any single type of threat actor leveraging this abuse. Um, it range, ranges from unskilled or unaffiliated random threat actors on the internet that are just trying to hack something uh, for fun, all the way up to financially motivated threat actors that are running banking Trojan operations, um, or even up to larger scale ransomware operations. 
Um, and in some cases, red teams have actually developed C2 platforms that are based on this abuse, and they're using it on engagements in real world settings. And so it is, it just kind of shows that it's being widely adopted regardless of the skill set of the uh, of the threat actor. So now that we know the who and the why, uh, let's jump into what exactly they're doing when they're abusing these platforms. So as I said earlier, uh, one of the most important things for a uh, malware operator to do during a campaign is to stay anonymous. And the abuse of these platforms actually offers a um, pretty good level of anonymity. And they're able to do this by doing things like stealing users' accounts, um, which I'll go into detail about here in a sec, um, and also utilizing multiple profiles at the same time. Uh, if you have your campaign spread across multiple accounts, multiple channels, it's a lot harder to track down and, and shut down. Um, it's kind of a redundancy that they're able to set up. And uh, one of the biggest things is also using the domains that belong to this application uh, for communication, which I'm also going to go into depth uh, here in a few minutes as well. So when it comes to stealing Discord accounts, uh, one of the most common ways this is done is by stealing the access token. And what an access token is, is essentially an alphanumeric string that um, acts as an identifier for a uh, specific Discord user. And um, this access token is actually stored in plain text on whatever computer the Discord client is installed on. And since these are plain text, they are trivial to steal. And um, this has resulted in a lot of stealers or grabbers um, being implemented. Um, they can be implemented in language of choice by the attacker. So it could be C Sharp, Python, C, any anything they want. Um, the one caveat is that you must already have command execution or already have malware running on the client, well, on the computer that's, that uh, has the client installed. And um, this is commonly done um, by tricking a user to, um, to run a piece of malware that specifically just steals the access token. Um, this is very common in um, the gaming community where someone will be tricked into running something they think is a either like a cheat or a game crack or something like that. And then once that runs, the attacker gets the token and starts making actions on behalf of, of that user. And at the time of research, there is actually no client verification for, um, for Discord. Um, if you have the access token, you can basically do whatever you want with it. It, it won't actually verify that you are that user. Um, and typically these stolen accounts are used to create webhooks, which I'll be talking about here in a bit, um, and to also upload content to the uh, content delivery network. And um, I'll also be talking about that in a bit. And then um, it's, they're also used to uh, socially engineer more people. Uh, sometimes they'll go through the friend list of, of that user and then try to get their friends to run more malware so they have more stolen accounts. So just to show how easy it is to get a hold of these these token stealers, I generated this list in about two minutes by searching for Discord token stealer on GitHub. Um, it seems that a lot of these have been taken down now, but it seems that as soon as one gets taken down and a, another one takes its place, so there, there's never a shortage of, of token stealers on GitHub. This is a token stealer that I found on VirusTotal. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these token stealers get disguised as game cheats, uh, game cracks, key gens, that sort of thing, like it's the mid-90s. And uh, this one in particular is uh, named MaincraftGen.exe. Uh, turns out there's a game called Minecraft, and it is a clone of Minecraft. But literally all this file did was steal... They uh, steal a Discord token and then send it back to the uh, send it back to the attacker. There was literally no other functionality than that within this binary. So when it comes to stealing Slack accounts, it seems that they aren't stolen nearly as much as as Discord accounts, and that may be due to the fact that it's a slightly more complicated process, but not by a whole lot. And just like with Discord, the attacker needs to be able to have um, remote command execution or have malware installed on the host. And there is a browser cookie that's labeled D, and this can be used to gather a 
bunch more information on, on the user. And um, I'll actually show an example of, of how that works here in a sec. Um, but once they do have the access to this uh, to this to the host, um, they can access the client cookies that are stored in a SQLite database. And since it's a SQLite database, it's pretty trivial to extract the information. Um, and once they have these cookies, they can list the downloaded files URLs, so they can download the files from the URL that that file is hosted at. They can access the different workspaces that user belongs to, and they can actually impersonate that user. And interestingly, these cookies are unlikely to be expired in, uh, in most cases. So this is a tool called Slack Pirate. And what it does is it extracts workspace information by using the D cookie I mentioned a bit ago. And um, this will actually return the access tokens for individual workspaces that a user belongs to. And I've actually seen some write-ups where this is being used in real world red team engagements. And it's actually a pretty good tool to check out if you, uh, if you wanna learn more about, about Slack abuse and how, how stealing accounts works. This is a screenshot I took of me running Slack Pirate against uh, an account I created for the sake of this presentation. And what I did was I created the account and then I created a workspace, which I was an admin of. And then I created an, I joined another workspace that I was not an admin of. And so I took that D cookie, ran it through Slack Pirate. And within a couple seconds, I had access tokens for both of those uh, workspaces. Obviously, the one which I was an admin of is pretty valuable from the... Um, from the viewpoint of an attacker. As I mentioned earlier, one of the main reasons that accounts are stolen in the first place is to use them to generate webhooks. And webhooks are essentially a URL that a user can generate um, within the application and have data sent to that URL. And once the data is sent to that URL, um, it will then post that data into a channel uh, that was specified when the webhook was created. And this functionality is generally intended for bots that are integrated with another application and it can send updates or alerts to uh, to the user. Um, but as long as this data is sent in the correct format, which is essentially just a JSON file, any type of data can be sent to it as long as it's uh, hex encoded. And this, this can be text files, executables, PDFs, or even uh, custom formats in a lot of cases. And one of the biggest advantages of the webhook is that no Discord or Slack um, account or even a client is required to send data to a webhook. Uh, all that needs to be done is sending the data in the correct format to the URL uh, within an HTTP uh, post request. And um, one of the main benefits of, of this aspect is that the network traffic is uh, over HTTPS and it actually uses domains that belong to the application. Um, so because of this, if someone's looking at the network traffic, they're not really going to be able to tell difference between this traffic and legitimate Discord or Slack traffic. And so all of these reasons combined are um, make it webhooks really attractive for threat actors to use them for C2 comms and data exfiltration and um, anything like that. This is just a simple example of the Slack webhook format. Um, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, it can be highly customized, and there's a lot of documentation on Slack's website on how to customize these. And uh, up top, you can see the URL. Um, this is the URL that's used for all webhooks um, in Slack. And the section in brackets that says webhook info, that's unique to each webhook. And uh, so since this is an HTTPS when, it's, um, when it gets sent, you can see how... A, someone monitoring the network traffic wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this and a legitimate uh, webhook that was uh, generated through Slack. And so here we have an example of the Discord webhook format. Um, don't mind the skeleton. I just discovered that you can put 3D animations in PowerPoints. So I threw him in there. Um, it's a little bit more simple than the Slack um, webhook format. Uh, there's also a bunch of documentation on how to customize this. And uh, it's almost identical to how a Slack webhook works, where this is the URL that all webhooks use. The section brackets that says webhook info is also unique to, to each webhook. And this is also sent over HTTPS. So just like Slack, uh, if uh, someone was monitoring the network, they're not going to be able to tell the difference between this and uh, just normal Discord traffic. 
Uh, just to show a real world example of one of these webhooks being abused, um, this is actually a screenshot from the main function of the Minecraft gen executable I mentioned earlier that I found on VirusTotal. And you can see right here where the orange bar is, is um, the webhook that the stealer is going to be sending the stolen token to um, whenever this executes. Not only does this malware steal the access token, it also steals uh, a few more bits of information, including the username, the avatar, the phone number, email, location, and uh, it logs the user's IP address as well. And so here we have the actual function that sends the data back to the attacker. And as you can see, it's pretty simple. It's just a JSON format uh, sent in an HTTP post to um, a webhook. And once the attacker has this information, they can start um, performing actions uh, on behalf of that user. This is another example of a uh, token stealer. This one just happens to be Grotopia themed. And Grotopia is a multiplayer online game. It's kind of like a sandbox uh, casual style game. Um, and not only is this token stealer stealing the Discord token and the IP address and time zone, all that good stuff. It's also stealing data that is uh, related to Grotopia itself. Uh, in this case, it's stealing the Grow ID, which is essentially the player's identification number. And it's also stealing any save files that may be present on that uh, victim's computer. And now that we've covered the anonymity side of things, we're going to shift more to the actual file delivery and the delivery of malware. And uh, so what's happening here is that the content delivery networks of Discord and Slack have been um, frequently abused by threat actors to deliver malicious content. And we've actually observed this in several different attack phases, uh, just depending on the campaign and the attacker. And uh, so just like webhooks, this is all happening over HTTPS, um, which makes it a very attractive option for attackers to, uh, to host their files. And so the way this works is that when a file is uploaded to a Discord chat room or a channel, that file is then hosted on the Discord content delivery network. And uh, once this file is there, it's actually accessible by a static URL. And the file can be downloaded by anyone, regardless if they have a Discord client installed or not, or, or even an account. And uh, just like the webhooks, uh, this is all happening over HTTPS. Uh, so its network traffic looks just like normal Discord traffic. And it's becoming a pretty widely adoptive, adopted way of uh, hosting malicious content. And it's uh, pretty common to see stolen accounts being used to upload malicious content to the CDN. And this functionality is not unique to just Discord. It works the exact same way in Slack and provides the exact same benefits. And so first the file is uploaded and then the static URL is then accessible. And one thing I would like to point out is that active abuse of the Slack CDN is not nearly as common as it is for Discord. It does happen, but to a much lesser degree. Um, it, it, it's likely that the abuse of Discord is just simpler to do, and it's easier to steal the accounts. So um, maybe it has attracted more attention for those reasons. So during our research, we observed that the majority of the malicious files that were hosted on these CDNs were compressed in one form or another. And uh, the two most common formats we observed were GZ and image formats or IMG formats, however you want to say it. And uh, the compression here is essentially being used. It's a crude layer of obfuscation. And in tandem with the uh, fact it's being transported in HTTPS adds a uh, pretty strong layer of uh, obfuscation for these files. Now that we've gone over um, how the CDN works, let's cover some real world examples of it being abused. Uh, first, I'd like to go over a few examples of the CDN abuse being leveraged in the initial delivery of malware or the initial payload. And uh, this technique is pretty straightforward. It's basically just like hosting a file in the cloud and then having somebody download that file. Uh, but in this case, it's disguised as Discord or Slack traffic. So a lot of these files that are being hosted on the CDN um, are being distributed through typical phishing campaigns. Uh, here we have an example of um, an email that's claiming to be from the World Health Organization with new COVID-19 preventions. And um, honestly, this is one of the more low effort ones we came across. Uh, the link to the malicious zip file was posted plain text in the body of the email. There's really no effort made to hide the fact that it's a zip file hosted on Discord. And the infection chain itself was quite odd as well. 
the zip file actually contained a batch file that downloaded a Word document, which in turn downloaded the uh, NiMame Trojan from a compromised website. So uh, not exactly efficient by any means. And once we started looking for more emails, we realized this wasn't restricted to just English-speaking countries. And so we found Spanish examples, we found French examples, we found some Portuguese ones, and in this case, this is a German example. And um, in this email, uh, the sender is offering some sort of deposit for some transaction in the attachment. And uh, in reality, this attachment is actually just an image. There is no attachment on this email. And so when the user clicks on it, it takes them to uh, a Discord CDN URL rather than download an attachment. So looking at the HTML of the email body, you can see that the image was actually just a link to the Discord CDN, which um, in reality was just an ISO file being hosted on Discord. And uh, once that user clicked that image thinking it was an attachment, it would download that ISO. And then once that ISO was opened, it contained a PE32 payload named 30% pdf.exe, which in turn was just a form book payload. So as you can see with this graph, uh, the amount of emails containing links to these CDNs spiked dramatically around June 2020. And uh, that large spike coincides uh, pretty well with the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as was the case with most of the world, uh, more and more people started working remotely and likely using Discord and Slack uh, for staying in touch with uh, other people or for work. And I think this is a great example of how threat actors will always evolve in accordance with what's going on in the world. Um, new environments and new users are always seen as new opportunities by these attackers. And the pandemic and the wider adoption of working from home is a, uh, is a golden opportunity from the viewpoint of, of an attacker. Just to shift the topic a bit, uh, so far we've covered how the attackers are using uh, the CDNs for hosting the initial payloads or like the, the first stage of an infection. Uh, and as I discussed earlier on, this abuse is happening at different attack phases. And the malware we just covered was only in regards to uh, delivering the first payload or the first stage. And in some cases, uh, this abuse is only happening in the retrieval of secondary payloads or component retrieval or um, downloading uh, plugins for a specific type of malware. So uh, the next few slides, I'll be going over a few cases where this is only happening in uh, secondary phases. This is a good example of when a malware only reaches out to the CDN during the second second stage of the infection chain. Uh, in this particular example, uh, the first stage, which was delivered in a, uh, it, it was in a different manner, uh, it was responsible for downloading an ASCII blob that was then converted and injected into a remote process. And what we observed was that this technique of downloading a second stage payload um, from the CDN is common behavior in campaigns that were associated with uh, rats or stealers or any other malware that is typically meant for stealing information and sending it back to a, in a, an attacker. And uh, the secondary use of the CDN provides a much higher chance of um, the, that secondary stage being successfully downloaded. Uh, the Discord CDN traffic is a lot less likely to get flagged or noticed uh, than unencrypted traffic from, let's say, a static IP or a seemingly random domain or DDNS services or something like portmap.io, um, it's a lot less likely to grab the attention of someone looking for suspicious traffic. So back to the malware, uh, once that ASCII blob is decoded, the final payload was Remcos. And Remcos is a commercially available rat. It's quite powerful. It's fairly easy to get a hold of. It's often marketed as a monitoring software, but it's almost always used in a more malicious context like this than a legitimate monitoring context. Here we have an example of a malicious document being used as the first stage. And it, uh, this document was from a async rat campaign. And the interesting part about this document is the, uh, the file name. So the file name was word nitro kudlari. And Kodlari, which I apologize if I'm butchering this, is uh, roughly translates to codes to English from Turkish. And 
This appears to be possibly referring to Discord Nitro, which is the premium version of, of the Discord account. So rather than having any Discord Nitro tokens or, or codes or anything, um, this document just contained an embedded macro. And what this macro did was it deobfuscated and ran some, um, some PowerShell. And um, this PowerShell would uh, execute and then reach out to the Discord CDN and download a binary. And that binary was the async rat client. And here's the packet capture for that network traffic after the PowerShell executes. You can see down here at the bottom of the packet capture that uh, the PE header is still intact. There was no attempt made to hide the fact this is an executable. Uh, there was no sort of encryption or, uh, or compression done at all on this binary. This will be the last example of file delivery um, and component retrieval that I'll talk about before I start diving into C2 and data exfiltration. This example is a little bit different than the, uh, the ones I've shown so far. And here we have a, a payload being stored on the Discord CDN for a threat actor to, to reach out to and download after they actively exploit a vulnerability. Uh, and I'm sure everybody here has heard of the Mirai botnet, but for those who aren't familiar, the Mirai botnet is constructed almost entirely out of, uh, out of IoT devices that are running some form uh, of, of Linux. And Mirai will typically be used to carry out DDoS attacks or used to uh, brute force logins for SSH, for example. And Mirai is not the only botnet out there. Uh, there's tons of different botnets, but Mirai just happens to be one of the most well-known and uh, is pretty prolific. Um, there's another botnet called Qbot that operates very similar to Mirai. It's also used for carrying out DDoSs, uh, brute forcing logins. And in this example, uh, we saw a payload for a Qbot variant being stored on Discord for delivery after exploiting, exploiting a vulnerability on an IoT device. So onto our final section, uh, we're going to shift over to talking about C2 and data exfiltration. And I actually find this to be the most interesting topic regarding this type of abuse. Um, utilizing the webhook functionality, a malware operator can implement a fairly robust C2 infrastructure that's operated and managed almost entirely through Discord or Slack. And not only can the initial beacons and information about the infected host be sent back to the attacker, this method can also be used for data exfiltration of basically any data type. And the C2 infrastructure that an, attack, that an attacker implements uh, can be set up in varying levels of complexity. Some campaigns may just use these techniques for initial beaconing or basic information gathering. And some campaigns may use uh, these techniques for their entire C2 infrastructure. So the most basic implementation of C2 comms over webhooks is sending out an initial C2 beacon that informs the attacker that a host has been successfully infected. And this is a pretty good example of that. Uh, here at the bottom of the image, you can see that this malware is sending initial basic information about the infected host back to the attacker. Um, and this acts as a kind of a, an alert that lets the attacker know they have a new compromised host. And in this specific case, the attacker is using Discord only to implement the initial beacon rather than a full C2 infrastructure. After this beacon was sent, the rest of the C2 comms were done using port map IO rather than um, continuing with webhook abuse. In other cases, an attacker may go a little further with uh, implementing C2 comms over, over webhooks. And like this example here, we have an attacker that's running a WMIC script, which WMIC stands for Windows Management Instrumentation Command Line. And it's essentially just an interface within Windows that allows an administrator to query different bits of information uh, from a Windows system. And in this case, the attacker is enumerating different hardware information about the infected host. But before any sort of information gathering happens, the script first runs the net sh command, and it does this to change the firewall settings, which then allows a program called discord send webhooks.exe, which is pretty obvious what that binary does, but it uh, 
after it makes that firewall change, it allows the binary to send data to a specific webhook. And once that webhook binary is allowed past the firewall, the attacker should receive a message via webhook stating that the WMIC script is running. And this is useful because it lets the attacker know that the enumeration script has actually executed and that they should expect some sort of output um, in the near future. And if they don't receive this message, they know that something has gone wrong during the infection process. If everything went as planned, the malware should send off the information returned from the WMIC script and the attacker will begin the next phases of the attack. And this simple process of uh, sending an initial beacon to sending an update, then enumeration, and then sending a confirmation of enumeration is a very effective way for a threat actor to track the progress of an infection as it's happening in real time. Up next, we have our first example of ransomware abusing webhooks. And this particular example leveraged that abuse uh, for several different purposes regarding C2 communications. Uh, in this case, we observed a campaign associated with a pay-to-decrypt variant called LeakGap. And we noticed that it was abusing Discord webhooks as well. And once the infection process began, the ransomware registered the infected host with the attacker. And this was done by sending information to a webhook in a specific format. And uh, that format was created by the attacker to identify and register the infected host. And this essentially allow allows the attacker to track all the different infections and manage the decryptions in the event that a victim pays the ransom. Uh, and also in the event it, that a an attacker actually decrypts the, uh, decrypts the host. But... Uh, this, re this registration process can be very helpful to operators of larger ransomware campaigns uh, because when an operation gets larger and they have more infected hosts, it can become a lot easier to lose track of the status of, of the infected hosts that they've gathered. And once the host is registered with the ransomware operator, the encryption finally begins. And then LeakGap sends the attacker an update, uh, letting them know that the encryption has begun. And once again, the process of updating the attacker is, a, is really valuable from their point of view because it gives them insight into the status of the, of the attack process. Once the encryption process is complete, uh, as is common with most ransomware, the victim is then shown a ransom note and the files are no longer accessible uh, to that user. So now that we understand how this abuse works, uh, when it's abused, who's abusing it, what are we supposed to do with this information? Uh, before I wrap this up, I want to talk a bit about defense regarding what we've talked about so far. I also want to give everyone uh, some resources if any of you are interested in looking into this stuff at a deeper level. And then um, after that, we'll, we'll go into a Q&A. So first off, I want to talk a little bit about defense in the context of an enterprise or, or small business network. And honestly, if either of these apps are not required on your network, I would not allow them on your network. And I know that in a lot of cases, Slack will be necessary because it's 2021 after all, and uh, it's generally uh, geared towards a more professional demographic. But when I was working in the financial sector, uh, I worked for a bank, and I did not allow either of these apps to be installed anywhere. And um, no one needed either of those apps, so it was never really a problem. And it was just one less thing that kept me up at night, you know, wondering if there was someone snooping around my network. Uh, but uh, however, if they are required, uh, if possible, restrict the access to uh, only to those that need it, if that's, you know, within your power. And um, if they are used on your network, be sure to educate the users of the types of threats they may face while using them. Um, because a user can only make informed decisions to the extent of the, of the knowledge they have on the threat. So similar to users being trained on phishing attacks, it's really critical that they are aware of the possibility of a threat on the platform they're using. And in any case, it goes without saying that it is always critical to run uh, updated endpoint protection software. Um, but that, that's kind of security 101, but you know, you'd be surprised what people forget to do. Um, with regards to Slack, there are access logs that can be reviewed and monitored to see if there's any 
you know, suspicious activity on a specific account, if uh, there's any doubt that a an account has been compromised, there are logs you can go through. Uh, how, however, I am not aware of an equivalent log for Discord. Um, I tried looking for one and I could not find one. Um, so that is a bit of a downside. And uh, one last important thing to remember is to enable 2FA where possible. And I know it's not the best option um, for some people, but um, in, in some instances it can only help. And uh, there are certain times with uh, Discord and Slack where it's actually not going to help if the if the token or cookies have been stolen from, from a host. But it does add another layer of security when it comes to a password being stolen somehow and is uh, someone's trying to log in directly to, to an account rather than stealing the tokens. Um, so for a, yeah, for a, an enterprise network, it's, uh, it's best to restrict access as much as possible. So of course, when it comes to a home user dealing with these threats, uh, there's not going to be the same restrictions and rules that are imposed on a user who is on an enterprise network or a small business network. And in most cases, it's completely unrealistic to say that a person should not use either of these apps for home use. There are literally millions of people who, who safely use these applications every single day. Uh, I've safely used Discord for quite a few years now, as have most of my friends. I've used Slack on numerous occasions safely as well. And the key to staying safe on these platforms as a private user is to just be cautious. Um, always be wary of files and links that you don't expect. If it seems weird to you, don't download it, don't click it, uh, just like you would with a suspicious email. And uh, like I mentioned, Slack does offer some logs that can be reviewed if there is any doubt um, as to uh, who has logged into the account and when it was logged into. And um, that can always be double checked. And... It's always important to have some sort of anti-malware or endpoint protection running as well, even at home. And uh, as is usual with 2FA, uh, use it if it makes sense to you. If it works for you, uh, go ahead and try it out. And so lastly, and most importantly, don't be afraid to use these apps. Uh, they're fantastic ways to stay connected, uh, especially with the way the world has been going recently. It's really important to stay connected with people and uh, you know, stay connected and talk to talk to somebody. And the intent of this talk is not to generate any sort of fear or uncertainty about using them, but just to better inform people for for effective defense. And so, last thing before we go into a Q and A, um, I just wanted to give everybody some info uh, that they can they can go check out if they're interested in this and they want to learn more. Uh, first off, is the blog that me and my coworkers posted. Um, it's called Sewing Discord, Reaping the Benefits of Collaboration App Abuse. Um, this is a, this presentation has essentially been an extension of that. So a lot of what was in this presentation um, will be in that as well. Um, a really good source to learn about all this kind of stuff is to look at the Discord and Slack API documentation. Uh, it'll really help you understand how malware are, um, are abusing these uh, interfaces to uh, implement C2 infrastructures, deliver malware, basically all the stuff uh, we've just talked about. And uh, another really good way to get an idea how this how this all works is go look up token grabbers and stealers on GitHub. Uh, like I said earlier, a lot of them get taken down um, and then get put back up and taken down again. Uh, but there's a lot on there, and it, it'll give you some insight into how how these attackers are going about stealing stealing some of these accounts. And uh, searching for Discord and Slack domains on VirusTotal or any sort of threat hunting platform um, that tracks that kind of stuff is is really helpful. It's a really good way to uh, to to uncover new malware campaigns that may be abusing one of these services. Um, and it may take you down a rabbit hole where you find some really cool stuff. And um, it's always just great to kind of hop in and, and see what you find. So uh, one one source that I thought was really cool when I was when I was working on these slides was abusing Slack for offensive operations by Spectre Ops. Uh, I think it came out mid 2020, and it goes pretty in depth on how uh, Slack can be can be abused in an in a uh, offensive context. Uh, it goes really in depth. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know was possible until I read that article. So definitely go check that out. It is. 
um, it's pretty eye opening when it comes to uh, when it comes to Slack. So uh, after this, we're just going to go into a Q and A, uh, and we'll take your questions from there. All right, Chris. Thank you. That was fantastic. Great presentation. Uh, Thanks. I do. Off the top, want to apologize. It's come to our attention that the YouTube stream wasn't working as intended today. So that's what happens in your first try out of the gate. So we're going to get that fixed and, and we'll make sure that that is up and ready for next time. Uh, but we are going into Q&A, like you mentioned, Chris. So I want to go ahead and bring Nick Biasini into the mix now. Nick, welcome to the live stream. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me, Mitch. And great job, Chris. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Fantastic. Fantastic. So uh, my understanding is we do have some questions in queue. So I'm going to go ahead and butt out and give you gentlemen the floor to go over some Q&A and then take us home for the day. Should okay. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Uh, so we did have a few questions that came in uh, and, and a couple of other ones along the way. So let me start by asking, um, how does the actor identify the clear text tokens from the many encrypted tokens? And this was more about the, the token stealing that you talked about in the beginning of the presentation. Sure. Yeah. So uh, in every installation of, of Discord, the that access token is actually stored in the same location. It's a... Uh, it's in a specific directory within the, the Discord installation. And so if the attacker knows where that's stored um, and they find a host that has Discord installed, it's going to be in the same place every time. So once they know where to go, they're, they're going to be able to find it pretty easy. OK. Uh, as a follow up to that and kind of a follow on, is there anything that can be done uh, manipulating something like the RESTful API or anything else with encryption or various other things to protect that value at all? Um, from what I've seen, I, I, I don't know if that's an option. I haven't seen anything regarding that being abused or being leveraged for, uh, for, for dealing with that threat. So, um, it is a possibility that may be something to, you know, dive into and do some research on, but from what I've seen, I have not seen that happen. Okay. Uh, so you, you did talk a little bit about the ways that these threats were being distributed, but what was the most common way you saw them being distributed? Was it primarily being done through email or were there other means that we commonly saw uh, this stuff being distributed through? Sure, in, in regards to the token stealers, a lot of them are uh, are sent out as a game crack or a game cheat, that kind of stuff. And for the actual payloads that are being stored on Discord, a lot of those are going out through emails um, being disguised as either an image like we saw in the uh, one of those email examples earlier where the link is actually just a image that looks like an attachment or in some instances it's just a, a link where the actual it, it, it the the text is a different link than what it actually goes to and it takes you to the discord CDN so most of what we've seen uh, is being distributed in either phishing emails or um, or disguised as other applications. OK, cool. Uh, one other question that we did have uh, was focused more around red team use and abuse of this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you found? I know you mentioned that report that you used at the end, but could you talk a little more about what you found in the red teaming space and where potentially uh, people could find resources associated with that as well? Sure. Uh, and it, again, GitHub is is the best place to go for this kind of stuff. There are, and, I, and I'm sure there's some proprietary tools that some red teams may have, but uh, there there have been C2 um, C2 platforms that have been developed using the uh, the idea of of webhooks and extracting information and uh, exfiltrating it over those webhooks. And um, I would say GitHub is the best place to go if if you want to learn more about that kind of stuff because a, a lot of it's open source. So um, I think that's the best way to learn about it because you're able to actually look at the code and uh, and see how they're utilizing these things in uh, in a malicious context. And so I would say just go search around, just search up Discord C2 or Discord Token Stealer or Slack C2, that kind of stuff. And you're bound to find something that uh, is going to um, be pretty interesting. Okay, cool. Uh, let me do one last check and see if we had any last minute questions that popped in. 
I don't see any right now. Uh, there is one more thing I wanted to say as, as one of the people who was a researcher on this. Um, one question to ask yourself as a user is, why am I downloading this off of Slack or uh, Discord? So if you get an email and it has a link and it's going to Slack or Discord, ask yourself, why am I downloading something off of Slack or Discord? If you don't know why, it's probably not a good thing to click. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, with, with that being said, I, I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties along the way. Uh, we will be having that video up on YouTube regardless very shortly. Uh, in the future, when we do have the streams in YouTube, the easiest way to get access is by subscribing to that channel. Uh, as far as LinkedIn, please connect with us on LinkedIn so that you can see those live streams as well. Uh, and, and generally, we're also very heavily in on Twitter on Facebook, basically everywhere you look, you can find us. Uh, please do look for us. We're producing lots of content on our blog, on our Twitter account, wherever we can. So thank you again for joining us today. And we look forward to doing this type of a webinar for you again in the near future.